Thank you, Lord. Well, how many are you glad to be here this morning? I tell you, it's so good to see all of you today. We're delighted that you can be with us to come and magnify the name of Jesus and to celebrate resurrection. The fact that Jesus came and gave his life as a ransom for all of us so that we could be here today. Hallelujah. You know, the worst thing that ever happens to you is somebody takes your life or, you know, you end up passing away, you get to go to heaven. Huh? That's not so bad. Huh? Our loss is heaven's gain. Amen. Praise God. And so, you know, we have that blessed hope that, you know, most of mankind know nothing about. That's why Jesus gave the church commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel, the good news. I tell you, God only has good news. Now, again, you know, in, in many people's lives, they don't know that God is a good God and that he cares about it. I tell you, he is so smart. God is so smart. And we're gonna take a look at that here this morning about what it is that he did through the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. But not only is he smart, he loves you. I tell you what, God loves every human being. It is amazing sometimes to think about the grace of our Heavenly Father and His willingness. The Bible, you know, we have that highly celebrated verse of Scripture in John 3 and 16 that says that God so loved the world. Everybody say the world. Yeah, He loved the world so much that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever, whosoever, anybody would believe in Him that they would not perish but have everlasting life. And that's the promise that God makes to every person, every soul, every heart, because he loved you enough to send his son Jesus so that you could have life in him and enjoy heaven's very best. I tell you, we have so much to look forward to you guys. I know, you know, there's all kinds of turmoil and all kinds of, you know, perilous things that are going on in the world today, but I'm telling you, Jesus is coming again. And he's coming to receive his bride, just as he said, hallelujah. You know, for all of the prophecies that were made about his first coming, there are eight times as many that, recorded, or that are recorded in the word of God about his second coming. So I tell you what, he didn't double up, hallelujah. There's eight times as many scriptures that tell us that he's coming again. And you know, when Peter was writing in one of his letters, you know, it talks about the fact that he, uh, you know, people will say, well, where is the sign of his coming? Everything seems to be just like it always has been and so on and so forth. And, and what they don't realize is that he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth. Now, we're not talking about grapefruit here. We're talking about people because God loves people. And when it's all said and done, praise God, and when he has, you know, fulfilled the harvest that he waits for, you see, that's what the church has been put into the world for is to be reapers, to reap the harvest. And I realize, you know, that a lot of times people won't accept our testimony. You know, they'll scoff and they'll mock and they'll do all those things, you know, but that's what they did to Jesus. But you know what, praise God, his word is eternally true and he's gonna bring it to pass. Can you say amen? Would you bow your heads with me for just a moment? Father, we love you so much. We thank you for this time that we have to be here today. And God, we couldn't ask for a better day to rejoice in your very presence and to rejoice in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, I wanna thank you for ministering to each and every one of us right where we are by your spirit in our hearts, in our spirit, so that Father God, we can know more perfectly the way and the plan that you have for us. And Father, we just thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. God bless you. All right, did any of you bring a Bible? Do you have a device or something of that nature? If you do, I'd like to invite you to turn it with me to uh, Matthew chapter 28. Matthew, the 28th chapter. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from uh, the New Living Translation. It will be up on the screens for you to be able to you know, follow along with and because it does read a little bit differently. But let's begin Matthew 28 verse 1. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. Every time I read this, 
I just think about the swagger of this angel, you know? And you got to think about this with me, too. See, you know, people say, well, why do you roll the stone away? I mean, after all, you know, Jesus, I mean, he could, you know, he walked through a wall one time. So, so, so the rock was not the issue, right? It had to be a declaration or just a, a, a statement, you know? Now, of course, he invited the girls to go in and take a look, you know, and see that the tomb was empty and all of that. But I just love the fact, praise God, that he rolled this stone away and then sat on it. It's kind of like, take that, devil, you know? And so as we go on reading here, you'll notice his face shone like lightning, and his clothes was, uh, were as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. In other words, they passed out. Now, that's another interesting kind of thought, that all the men passed out, but the women were still conscious. <laughs> you gals, man, you got it going on, don't you? It says in verse 5, then the angel spoke to the women and said, don't be afraid. He said, I know that you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he isn't here. He is risen from the dead just as he said he would. Hallelujah. Come and see where his body was lying. And now go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead and is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him there. And remember what I have told you. Can you imagine these girls? I mean, all of this is going on, this, this divinely granted uh, visitation from heaven of this angel and his communicating with them and telling the story. I'm sure that they were so awestruck, you know, that they could have ran off and forgot. Now, what did he say? What did he say? But he said, remember what it is that I've told you so that when you get there, you can actually intelligently tell people <laughs> what I've said. And so they did just that. I want to talk to you this morning for just a little bit about three days that changed everything. You know, there are a lot of things that go on in our lives that, that we don't even know anything about. I mean, there are defining moments that can impact our lives and other things that happen that don't maybe necessarily, you know, impact our lives. For example, if I, if I give you this date, if I give you January 7th, 1979, can any of you think about what, what, what that was all about? And you probably say, well, you know, my sister got married or something, you know, something like that. But no, January the 7th of 1979 is when this church was born. When we got together with 34 people. Yeah, you can give the Lord a great big round of applause. <laughs> Hallelujah. Things look a lot different now than they did then. And you know, in that same year, in, uh, December the 16th, it is when we occupied this property for the very first time. And you know, we only had the one building where the youth and the administrative offices and things are, but my, how things have changed and what God has done within our lives. But you know, maybe I could say May 7th, 1945, would that, would that trigger anything in any of your people's lives? Perhaps, maybe not. But it was the end of the World War, the Second World War. And then if I go on and I talk about you know, July the 20th, 1969, does anybody know what that was? You say, man, you're asking some hard questions. It's when we went to the moon and landed on the moon. Neil Armstrong was the first guy to set foot on that. If I mention 9-11, probably we can all think about that particular moment. How about the day you got married? Now, guys, if you've forgotten what that day is, it might be good for you to go back and look at the certificate, okay? Huh? The day you got married. Maybe... Maybe uh, when your first, second, or third child was born. These are all defining moments in our lives that, as I said, sometimes impact our lives. And, you know, if we took time, we could think of all the significant defining moments within our lives that impacted us, you know, at that time, and even potentially could impact us throughout our lifetime. But through the prophets, God said that this is going to come to pass, that Jesus would be crucified, buried, and rise from the dead. And thank God that's exactly what happened. Amen? Those three days encompassed the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and it forever changed the lives, quite literally, of billions of people. You and I are still being impacted by that day when he came up out of that grave. 
And not only that, praise God, but all of eternity is going to be impacted by the fact that our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, was raised from the dead. Hallelujah. And so, you know, the reason I bring this up to you, and I mentioned it earlier, is, is that, you know, there are a lot of things that go on in, 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 in our lives or during the time of our lives that we don't know anything about. Now, there were a lot of people, even in Jesus' time, they didn't really know what was going on. I mean, they were all heading for Jerusalem because it was the Passover, and so it was a, a feast of the Jews, and there'd be great you know, celebration and things that they had to do and so on and so forth. But I'm, I'm going to guess that a lot of people didn't even know, didn't even have a clue what it was that was going on in Jesus' life. I'll give you a couple of examples just in the natural. You know, um, we had a president, President Kennedy, back in 1961, who made a declaration. He stood up and said, hey, we're going to put a man on the moon. And everybody said, yeah, okay. And the reality is, is within, actually within or less than 10 years, like I said, in 1969, Neil Armstrong was out there dancing around. Are you listening to me? Well, again, you know, when you think about that, the Apollo program was... I mean, they had things ratcheted up. They, they took, an, uh, within six months, they went back again. And then we got to Apollo 13, where they were going to go back again. And you remember when Tom Hanks played in that, that, I don't know, it was probably 1995. Some of you weren't even born then, but it's okay. You know, <clears throat> and uh, something went awry. I mean, some things went really wrong. And they're 200,000 miles away, and uh, their spaceship in functioning the way that it should. Now, the reason I bring that up is, is that we have no idea how close that those men may have been to never coming home. Now, we see it in the movie and all of the things that they had to overcome, but my point is, is that, you know, uh, these things happen this way, and and a lot of times we don't know, know anything about it. I just watched a docudrama here just not too long ago about World War II and Hitler, and they had a machine, it was a coding machine called the Enigma. How many of you know anything about that? All right, well, this machine is how they talk to one another, you know? And, and the problem was is that the Allied forces couldn't figure out what they were doing, what they were saying. It changed every 24 hours. And so what they did is they brought the most brilliant people together that they could find, half a dozen of them or so, to try to figure out how to break this code. And um, the fact of the matter is, is that they did, it's, it's an astounding story really, but they were able to do it. But then once they figured it out, they couldn't, they couldn't tell anyone what they had discovered because if the Germans found out, they would change it. So there were a lot of things that went on and there were still people that lost their lives and different things of that nature. But it's been said statistically that they probably shortened the, uh, uh, the war by two years and over 14 million people probably lived instead of died. Now, statistically speaking. Well, the reason I bring that up to you is, is that most of us don't know anything about that. We don't know how these men in a room figuring out how to decode this thing probably changed our lives in a very significant kind of way. Well, something happened 2,000 years ago when Jesus went to a cross and died for the sins. And and the reality is, is most people were clueless as to what it is that was going on in that time period of his life. And so, without question... The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, it is the most significant event in the Christian faith when he was raised from the dead. But like I said, so many don't know anything about it. It's so unfortunate that people don't know the story. They don't know anything about it. You know, ignorance is not bliss. People have their own ways of thinking about this, that, and the other, and you know, and, and, and certainly we're all entitled to it. But I tell you what, there's nothing more precious than the truth. How many of you remember Jay Leno? You know, when he had his show, he had a thing called jaywalking. Any of you remember that? Again, maybe some of you are too young to even know what that is all about. But he had this deal. He'd go out on the street, and he'd ask people questions. And and some of them, you know, he said, uh, uh, he would ask a question, who's the first president? Somebody, you know, would say, Abraham Lincoln. You know, well, Abraham Lincoln, for those of you that don't know, he was not the first president, all right? Uh, 
and, and, and so they would ask, you know, they would show, he would show a picture to people. He would say, who is this? And it was a picture of Hillary Clinton, and they, they, they couldn't even tell him who, who she was. Maybe some of you can. I don't know. Okay? Or he might, you know, he would come up. Now, this is, this is, uh, this is wild. He would ask the question, what color is the White House? And so, and not, I'm not kidding you. People go, oh, you know, I don't know. Is it blue? You know, I mean, you know, they didn't know. Or what country is the Panama Canal in? Well, the Panama Canal is not in either country. It just divides North and South America. That's all it does. So he would, he would ask these questions. But, but the point that I'm trying to make is, is that in many cases, maybe they were simple questions or whatever, but people could not come up with the answer. And I think about that when it comes to the gospel and the Lord Jesus Christ and the simple message that God sent his son into the world so that mankind could be delivered, set free, and have everlasting life. That's the simple message, but how few really know what that message is. You know, uh, Jesse Walters, he does this, well, he used to, I don't know if he does it anymore, on Fox News, he, he would do the same thing. He'd do kind of a, a facsimile of the same. He'd go out and ask people questions, you know, and, 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 and the discovery of how uninterested, disinterested, or just flat out unknowledgeable about this and that and the other that people were, it, it really is amazing. So if I ask the question, you know, well, why do people celebrate Easter? Um, you know, why do, we, why do we recognize it? What is it all about? Well, you know, people, I mean, they might say, well, yeah, I don't know. It's some religious holiday, I guess, you know, people, everybody goes to church. You know, or maybe they say, you know, people go to church on that day when they normally don't. Or maybe they say, well, you know, isn't that when the Easter Bunny shows up and gives a bunch of candy to a bunch of kids? I mean, those seem kind of, you know, simple, but you might be surprised how few people really know what Easter is all about or what the resurrection of Christ is all about. You know, in the verse that we read there in the text, in verse 7, the angel told these girls, he said, go tell my disciples. And he said, remember what it is that I have told you. Now, let me ask you a question this morning. Who was the message for? That's a simple question. There's, it's not a trick. The disciples. In other words, you know, in other words, to whom were these women sent? They were sent to the disciples. Now, they could have been sent to anyone, but there was this one particular group that Jesus wanted, to, wanted them to know that he was alive. Now, even at that, they had a hard time and struggled with it. But you know, when, we don't really see this, but the reality is, is there were all kinds of people groups. Say people groups. Yeah, there's all kinds of people groups you know, that, that were a part of this, this three-day event. And, and uh, the question that I might ask you this morning is, is what group do you belong to? Or would you have belonged to? Which one of them might you have espoused to? Well, you know, you might just say, well, it depends on what time of my life that you're talking about. But last week, Pastor Brian was talking about Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And you know the story of how they took palm branches and their clothing and things like that and laid it down before, the, before uh, King Jesus as he came in. And they were all, you know, celebrating and, and, and raising their voice and saying, Hosanna in the highest, you know. And, and we all come to understand, you know, well, they're just, you know, singing Jesus' praise. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that Hosanna means save now. Okay, well, we would, you know, we could look at that and say religiously, well, of course, yeah, that's, that's why Jesus came. He came to save us now, you know. And the truth of the matter was they weren't thinking about eternity. They were thinking about the right now being under the tyranny of the Roman government. And so really what they were wanting him to do is to deliver them out from underneath it. In other words, uh, it was a little bit of a self-interest kind of thing. Save us now from this tyranny. 
You remember the two men on the road to Emmaus after Jesus was raised from the dead. And you know how they, they were walking along, Jesus comes up alongside them. His, his, uh, his actual, uh, who he was, was veiled. They didn't know it. And man, there's people clear over here. Hallelujah. Thank God for Easter Sunday. Well, anyway, you know, they, they, they didn't know who he was. And so Jesus engages them in conversation. He says, you know, what, what are you guys all bummed about? And they said, man, are you a stranger in Jerusalem? Don't you understand what it is that's going on? And they start telling their story. And at the end, they said, we thought. Everybody say thought. Yeah, they thought that this was the guy that was going to deliver them or deliver Israel. Okay? So all their hopes were shattered as a result of his being crucified. So the reason I say that is, is there was this people group and they were really interested in their own kind of deal. Get me out from underneath. Isn't that kind of like what people are like these days? Oh God, if you just, you know, you'll, you, you, you know, if you'll get me out of this mess, man, I'll serve you forever. And that lasts about five minutes. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Don't raise your hand. Yeah, I think we're all a little bit that way. Well, there's another group. There was the elders and the religious leaders. Uh, maybe you are part of that group. Now, that group hated Jesus. And he was nothing but a problem to them. And all they wanted to do is get rid of him. They were such hypocrites. You know, they didn't want to do their own dirty work, so they got the government to do it for them. That was the whole deal. Then there's another group. Well, the government, you know, Herod and Pilate. And, you know... The whole thing was just an annoyance. It was like a burr underneath their Because the Jews were always, you know, after this guy and wanting them to do something. It's kind of like, leave me alone. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Then there was the self-serving group. And I would, I would refer to that group as Judas and uh, the soldiers. Huh? They were willing to betray, to mock, to humiliate. And, and to beat the innocent for their own advantage and what they could derive from it. And then there's another group. You say, how many groups have you got? There were a lot of people, okay? There are the disillusioned and, the fra- and afraid. Who would that have been? The disciples, dude. They tucked tail and ran. Now they said, no, nah, there ain't no way we'll ever do that. But you know as well as I do, that's exactly what they did. Peter denied him, all of those things. You know, and I have to say that if we were in the same circumstance, we'd probably been in the same boat. But they were scattered everywhere. And then finally, there were these faithful people. And again, it was these women. And they stood with him. They watched him die. They prepared his, his body and burial. They went out the next, well, sometimes, sometime later after the, the, the um, feast, you know, And they went out to prepare his body, all of that, because they loved him and they followed him. You know, Mary Magdalene was, she was not a good person. There's no telling what her history would have been like, but she was not the best. And yet, Jesus, the Bible said, cast seven devils out of her and set her free, and her life was never the same. And you know, Jesus made the statement, to whom much is forgiven... Those people love much, and she sure did, because she realized what it is that he had done for them. But I'm just saying all of this to say that, you know, people have a lot of different ideas based upon what they know and what they don't know. Today, we got all kinds of people saying all kinds of things based upon what they think they know. But in many, many cases, they don't know anything. And, you know, you talk about cancel culture today. I'm telling you what, they were doing everything. You talk about... These things are all the same. They don't change from generation to generation. It's the same devil. It's the same evil spirit. It's the same thing. You know, generation after generation, they wanted to silence Jesus. But I got good news for you on that deal, my friends. They ain't going to be no silencing Jesus. Are you listening to me? I'm telling you, the Bible says that upon this rock, I am going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not 
prevail against it. So whatever it is that you see in can, you know, cancel culture and all of that, don't you worry about a thing, praise God. Now, the other thing I would suggest to you is if you're part of the cancel culture, you might want to change the group that you're hanging out in. Because there is truth in the Bible that sets the captive free. And you know, so many times, you know, people think certain things, but they don't know the truth. And so they walk in the darkness that they're in and miss what it is that God has for them because of their own blindness, their own wickedness, their own whatever you want to call it. But I tell you what, Jesus came to set the captive free. Are you listening to me? And so it becomes imperative where our lives are concerned to understand that. So it just pays to be informed. You know, I didn't know, you know, up until 19 years of age, on a summer evening, you know, in August, I gave my heart to Christ. But, but leading up to that, I didn't know anything about it. I had my own opinions, I, you know, and basically my opinions were just like all of culture. It depends on, you know, what pot you're growing up in. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But what we need to do, praise God, is we need to get out of that pot and get in the place where we belong to find out the truth so that the truth can make us free. Can you say amen? You know, Jesus made this statement, if you continue in my word, then you're my disciples indeed, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. And all I'm really doing is just inviting you to consider what it is that I'm talking about. If you want to keep on with wherever it is that you're at, that's your deal. But you know, praise God, it might give you reason for pause to think about this for a moment, where your, your thinking, your thought patterns, and how it is that you believe, what you believe, why you believe it, and how it relates to this book. Because the fact of the matter is, is that God said he would send a deliverer, and he did so in the form of his son. And he, in fact, went to the cross and died and was raised again by the glory of the Father. And the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus said, I am coming again. And so we know, we don't know when, we don't know the hour, we don't know the day, but it's going to happen. And you want to be on the right side of that equation. You really do. You know, it, it isn't worth your holding on to some kind of fictitious kind of thinking and pattern of thought that isn't true. I didn't know that. So many that are in this room this morning, they didn't know that. But yet Jesus came for each and every one of us so that we could live. So again, it's important. I want you to turn with me to John chapter 18 again. Uh, it'll be up on the screen if you don't have a Bible. John chapter 18. And let's just talk about the truth for a minute. Y'all y'all doing all right? Okay. <clears throat> like I said, the Jews were a thorn in Roman government's side. They were just always creating problems. And so... They didn't want to do the dirty work of getting rid of Jesus, but they sure enough wanted to get rid of him. You know, and Pilate just simply asked a question. He says, why are you bringing this guy to me? He said, well, he's a criminal. And you're the one that's supposed to take care of criminals. So he said, all right. It seems to me like, you know, I would say that Pilate probably got up on the wrong side of the bed this morning. I would probably say to you that he hadn't had near enough coffee and he was just aggravated by the whole concept. You know, it's early and these guys are bugging him and all this, you know. And he says, all right, all right. So he, he, he summons Jesus, you know, because they'd apprehended him the night before. He'd, you know, been imprisoned with him. And, he, and he's brought into uh, the palace where, the, where Pilate is, the governor. And he makes this statement beginning in verse 33. Then Pilate went back to his headquarters and called for Jesus to be brought to him. And he just asked him a simple question, are you the king of the Jews? Now there's no other king but Caesar, okay, so that doesn't bode real well in cultural kinds of circumstances. He said, are you? Are you the king of the Jews? And then he goes on to say, uh, Jesus replied, I, I love this. You know, he said, is, is this your question? Or... Did others tell you about me? 
You know, I mean, all of a sudden, he's just, he's right in the middle of Pilate's stuff. You know? And then Pilate's response, he says, dude. He didn't say dude, but you know. (laughs) He said, am I a Jew? Of course he wasn't. He retorted, your own people and their leading priests brought you to me for trial. Why? I mean, what have you done? So in other words, he's just not real sure why he's involved in this whole situation in the first place. And Jesus answered and he said to him, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Are you listening to me? So he immediately makes a distinction between earthly kingdoms and heavenly kingdoms. Isn't that right? Where everybody else is looking at the earthly circumstances and how this is going to impact my life in a natural kind of way. And Jesus is just saying to them, that isn't what I'm all about. So he goes on to say, my kingdom is not an earthly kingdom. If it were, my followers would fight to keep me from being handed over to the Jewish leaders. But my kingdom is not of this world. So Pilate said, well, all right, so, so are you a king? You know, he's just trying to get to the bottom of this deal. And, and Jesus responded, well, you say that I'm a king. Actually, now listen to this carefully. Listen, actually, I was born and I came into the world to testify to the truth. All who love the truth recognize that what I say is true. And so Pilate, again, a man, you know, blind and, and unaware, just responded by saying, what is truth? Well, the fact of the matter is, is truth was standing right in front of him. Huh? And so then he went out and he told the people, he says, man, dude, this guy, ain't, he's not guilty of any crime. And so you know the rest of the story, how that, you know, they gave Barabbas to them and, and crucified Jesus. But the common characteristic of all these people groups that we talked about was that none of them actually knew what was going on and why. They didn't know that he came as a savior to the world. They didn't know that he took our place as a substitute so that we wouldn't have to die in our sin. And so this perception and this perspective that people had, I mean, they just really weren't, they were, they were clueless. And the truth is that he was the king of kings and that Jesus came into this world to save you and me. And the Bible says that whoever will call on the name of the Lord can be or will be saved. And that's not something you do out of your head. It's something you recognize in your heart. You know, <clears throat> Paul said uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, this is a trustworthy saying and everyone should accept it, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners and I am the worst of them all. But God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience and even uh, with even the worst sinners. And then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive everlasting life. Do you know how many people really would like to have a savior, but they say, I don't deserve him? And you know, they would be right. But you know, it can be said of all of us that we don't deserve him. And so if you happen to be in this congregation this morning and and you feel as though you're undeserving, well, you're in good company. Because each and every one of us, none of us, the Bible says, are righteous. No, not one. But he does offer eternal life to whosoever that will. So don't allow the lie that you're undeserving or that you are, have done too many things wrong or he would never accept you or any of the other things that we often reason in our mind. Accept the truth that says, praise God, whosoever will that will come to him, he will for no reason turn them away. Isn't it glorious when you think about the grace of God in our lives? So I just ask you this morning, do you have a problem? Are you in the wrong people group? Do you need to find another place? 
I'm telling you what, God, through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, has opened up the door for you so that there may be access so that you can receive salvation and eternal life. Now, let me, let, me, let me take it a step further because a lot of people aren't convinced about this whole, you know, resurrection stuff and eternal life and being born again. And, you know, is, is it really real? You know, because most people that I, I remember when I was a kid, a teenager, I thought that religion was a crutch. You know, there's people in the world and they just got to have that. And so that's what they do. But that's not for me. So that's just another way of thinking about life and things and this and that and the other. And yet I was absolutely wrong about my thinking. So what about you? Is all of this resurrection stuff really true? Is salvation through repentance, is, is that really a possibility? Is that something that can happen? Well, I, I'll ask you this question. Is gravity real? Go get on the scale. <laughs> gravity is real, isn't it? But let me ask you a question. Can you see gravity? Like I said, if you get on the scale, sometimes you can, you know. No, you, you can't see the force of gravity, but you can see its result. Isn't that right? And so when I ask you, or when you ask me about whether or not the resurrection is real, I would emphatically tell you absolutely yes, it is real. And everything that I've shared with you about God's plan for you to be saved is absolutely real. Now, you can't see it, but nevertheless, it exists. And so um, if people will make a decision to open their hearts up to God's possibility, life can be so much different. How many of you can attest to that? Absolutely. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord, they can be saved. And so to bring my message to a close this morning, I just want to talk to you believers for a little bit. You know, I've communicated quite a bit about, you know, God's plan for salvation and things of that nature, but I want to talk to you because I tell you what, praise God, today is a day of celebration and promise for you, child of God. And if you're discouraged with life or if you're afraid of this or that, thank God you, I mean, have no fear. God hasn't given you the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Yeah, but what's going on in the world? Well, listen, don't be like the guys that were singing Hosanna in the highest, man. Be the guys and the people, praise God, that knew what the eternal final purpose is going to be and rejoice and focus on that and rejoice in that. Because, you know, Jesus, he made this statement to his disciples. He said this to them. He said, don't let your heart be troubled. Well, you know, sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge. How many of you know what I'm talking about? But he said, let not your heart be troubled. Why? Because you believe in God, believe also in me. He said, in my father's house, there's many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. But I am going to go and prepare a place for you. Everybody say, I have a place. Have a place. There is a place that he is preparing for you. Hallelujah. And he said, and if I go, I will come again. You can go to the bank on it, my friend. Dude, I'm telling you what, there's going to be shock and awe, right? But I'm telling you, when the king of kings shows up on this planet, when everything's, you know, cinched up, taken care of, and done, and he comes again, life is going to be real different. Everybody say hallelujah. Yeah, amen to that. And so it's important for us to understand that his resurrection not only gave us eternal life, but he gave us his power, power to live, power to acceptably, you know, live in this life and be an honor and a praise to the king of kings. Hallelujah. You know, he didn't just save you and say, okay, you got eternal life. He saved you and then he put himself in you so that you could be empowered to live as he would have you to live. Everybody say, I have his power. You have his power, glory to God. And not only that, but you have his power to overcome, to live a life as he knows it, power to obtain victory and over the challenges of the negative uh, circumstances of life. Hallelujah. We all face them. You may be facing one right now, but I'm telling you what, thank God, today you're not alone and you weren't yesterday. Are you listening to me? 
The same God that resurrected Christ from the dead, if you're a believer, lives on the inside of you, and he is on your side. And he's for you on this day. Power to set the captive free. Power to administer life to those that are still lifeless. I mean, the world needs you, my friend. The Bible says that you're the salt of the earth. The Bible says, praise God, that you are not only that, but the light of the world. Did you know the world needs you? You know, let's not turn our back on the world. Let's not just say, you know what, I'm just tired of all of this and I don't want to put up with it. Let's keep loving the world because they need the message that God has placed within your heart. They need what it is that you have and they just don't know it. They're in one of them people groups. And one of them, you know, that probably I haven't even mentioned. But he he placed within us an eternal hope. And I just want you to know this morning, praise God, that God not only has a plan for our lives in this life, but he's got a plan in the future. Hallelujah. When, when, When Peter was writing about it, the Bible says that he had given us birth or caused us to be born again unto a living hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance. Did you all know you got an inheritance coming? Huh? And, and it's the likes of which you, you can't even begin to imagine what, I mean, we can't. I mean, the reality is we have no idea what's coming, but I'll, I'll guarantee you this much, it's out of this world. Huh? To an inheritance that's undefiled, that cannot fade away, reserved in heaven for you and me. So that should give us reason and encouragement to continue on fighting the good fight of faith, raising our kids as God would have us to, fighting for them, fighting for our marriages, fighting for the things that are right and just and good, and not want to quit and give up and lose heart. But keep on keeping on, keep praying, keep believing. Continue on in the, in the work that God has called you to because the end, it's drawing near, it's coming. And we as the church, we as believers, we are the ones, praise God, that, the, that heaven is looking to, to be able to be the conduit to the world around us. So don't lose heart. Be glad, rejoice. Because there's things that are coming our way and not the distant future. Y'all glad you're here today? Why don't you just stand with me for a moment, if you would, please? Let's bow our heads together. Hallelujah. I just, I exhort you, my brothers, my sisters, let's rejoice. Let's rejoice in, in, let's remain steadfast in what it is that he's called us to. Let's not be soon moved away, but thank God, let's believe the Bible. And let's know, praise God, that he will bring his will to pass. Would you bow your heads with me now? Father, we just love you so much. We're so grateful for your blessing, Father, in this house. And Father, we thank you for the promises that are ours to enjoy and the reality of them. Oh, Father, thank you for the resurrection of your son, the Lord Jesus. And how that you made good on what it is that you said that you would do. But you also said, Father, that whoever would call on the name of the Lord would be saved. So Father, I pray for those that are within the sound of my voice, even those that may be watching online. And God, I pray that if they've never made this decision to receive you, that, Father, that you draw them to you right now. Speak to their hearts, Father. Help them to know there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And that you, you gave your son as a ransom for them. While your heads are bowed, your eyes are closed, no one's looking around. If you're here this morning, you've never made a decision. Maybe you didn't even know that there had to be a decision made. If you've never made that commitment to Christ, but something on the inside of you is just, you know, making you to know, I I need to do this. I need to call on the name of the Lord. I need to ask him, you know, to come into my heart, be the Lord of my life. And that I, I know I want to give him all of my heart 
all of my soul and all of my mind. If you're there standing while every head's bowed, eyes closed, and you say, Pastor, that's me, and I, I, uh, I ask you for your prayer. Can I see your hand anywhere as I look across this crowd this morning? All right, thank you, ma'am. You can put it down. Anybody else? I know there's a lot of people here, so give me a moment, but just raise it up high. I want to know him because I, I, I didn't know what you just told me. Anybody else? Praise God. All right. Very good. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. Thank you, sir. Bless you. Anybody else? You know, the Bible makes it clear that today is the day of salvation and now is the accepted time. You know, maybe you're here this morning and you really, you know, if, you, if you're real honest, you just have to say, you know, I haven't really been walking with, the, with uh, Jesus. I mean, I know him and but I got to tell you, if I'm honest, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm cool. Uh, I'm, I'm away and I want to come back. Well, listen, what better day than Easter morning than to say, you know what? Today is the day I'd made my decision and commitment to return. Is there anyone here this morning that that would identify you? And you say by your uplifted hand, Pastor, please pray for me because I want to get myself right with God because I know that he's coming again. Is there anyone as I look again? Let me just for a moment take this time, raise it. Thank you. God bless you. Anybody else? All right. Thank you, ma'am. God bless you. Anybody else? Anyone else? <clears throat> Thank you, sir. God bless you. Anyone else? There is such hope, oh, and such grace and such blessing in having a right relationship with him and being in fellowship with God. Don't let another moment, you know, be stolen from you because of this or that or the other. You know, sometimes people, they're, they're angry or they're, they're upset or they, they just, you know, they've got issues. Man, I'm telling you, come back to the Father that loves you and let him help you work through whatever it is that seems to be holding you. Is there anyone else before we pray? Hallelujah. <clears throat> All right, church, together I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me. We're doing this for those that raise their hands. And those of you that raised your hands, what we want you to do is we want you to pray this prayer out loud. Loud enough for you to be able to hear yourself pray it. And while you're praying, I just want you to let your heart agree with this simple prayer so that right where you're standing, God can meet you there and change your life forever. Again, would you bow your heads with me and pray this prayer together? Say this, church. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you today without any reservation. Forgive me, Father, of all my sins. Come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Save me as you said and promised that you would do. And I thank you for it. And I declare that Jesus is my Savior and that he is my Lord. And I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. <clears throat> Coming to the close of our service when we dismiss, there are quite a number of you that responded by basically saying for the first time you wanted to receive Christ. And I'm going to remind you of this when we dismiss, but I'd love for you to be able to come and join me. I just want to congratulate you. Just come. I'll be right here. I just want to shake your hand. And we have some people that we have within the uh, um, uh, church that provide spiritual guidance. And they would just like to congratulate you as well and also be able to place some materials in your hand to help you to get started in your commitment. Now, I know you got an option. You can, you know, when we dismiss, you can go out the doors or you can come down here. I hope you'll do that. You know, I don't bite, man, really. 
And we just love to put this stuff into your hands again to help you get started. Bring the people that you're with if you need to. Sometimes I know sometimes that can seem a bit threatening or you know whatever, but however you got to do it, we'd love for you to do that. All right, we're going to receive our communion service.